So I understand that all of you in about, what, three weeks or two weeks, have this pitch thing that you've got to do. How long is it? Two weeks? Three weeks? Three. three weeks from now. And that each of you are going to be faced with a challenge. Your team has four minutes, is it? To make your case to why those investors should invest in your idea for a good science education app, right? And then you've got to do something else. You've got to stand there and withstand their questions for four more minutes. Is that right? So you guys have to think hard. And over the next couple of weeks, are going to be thinking pretty hard, not just about your idea, which I'm sure are great ones, but also about how you're going to communicate your idea. So I was asked to come here and share an example of mine from my past about leadership and about exercising leadership and how one can be effective and how communication is such an important part of leadership, how you choose to communicate your message. So I thought I would come up with an example from not so long ago, and hopefully all of you will maybe be interested in the story, even the young ladies in the back, and maybe all of us. If we are interested in the story, I'm asking you perhaps to consider how we're communicating it. Not that maybe my story is at all relevant to your pitch or your pitch or your pitch, but that how storytelling can draw people in and that even in a difficult to convince audience, a venture capital group, you can win them over through how you choose to communicate your message. So it all started six years ago behind a middle school in East Somerville. There was a young girl, a very innocent middle school girl, who got invited by a couple of gangbangers back there. And it was awful. They raped her, and it was front page of the Somerville Journal, made the metro section of the Boston Globe. The neighbors in East Somerville were outraged. They demanded that something be done, and they knew why. Soon, there were stories in the local papers. It wasn't just two guys. It was a gang. And it was the initiation right of the gang to become a member. You had to rape a girl. It was awful. The neighborhood had town meetings. Hundreds of people came. And at those meetings, they said, you city councilors, you Mr. Mayor, do something. Now, if you're an elected official, who elects you? Those people. They're, what do we call them? Voters. And if you don't get their votes, you're out. So those elected officials, they started to do something. One of them goes online, and he finds an ordinance, which is basically a fancy name for a law that cities pass. He goes online and finds an ordinance. Stopping gang members was the name of the ordinance. Anybody that looks like they are in a gang the police shall have the right to disperse them. And if not, if they refuse to go, to arrest them. Sounded like a good idea. So he took it to the city council. They voted on it, 13 to nothing, to become a law. They take it to the mayor. The mayor has a press conference. Great idea. We're going to stop those gangs in East Somerville. Signs it into law. Because this is the kind of law that required state approval, it comes up to the legislature. The House passes it. Unanimous vote, 164 to nothing. It comes to the Senate. It goes to the Committee on Public Safety. And one person votes against it. Me. Now, why would I support those awful gangs? Well, I'll tell you why. There was a hearing we had, and we have hearings to better understand, out of the heat 
of the moment, the heat of all that anger in East Somerville, so that we could start to ask some questions. So the police chief from East Somerville comes up, from Somerville comes up and testifies before our hearing. We need this law to keep the young girls of Somerville safe, he said. And I said, well, Mr. Police Chief, I understand that this is a law about stopping gang members, but the law says that the police shall have the right to go after anybody that looks like they're in a gang. Mr. Police Chief, who is it that looks like they're in a gang? How do you know who's in a gang? Well, we can tell, said the police chief. And I said, well, can you tell me the names of those members who are in gangs? Well, their last names, the two guys who were committed the rape, are Cruz and Trujillo. Oh, I said, they sound like they're Hispanic. And he said, yes, and this gang, MS-13, are people who are Hispanic. We know they're in gangs because they speak Spanish on the street. Oh, I said, being the only Hispanic member of the Senate, I asked, so you know they're in gangs because you hear them speaking Spanish on the street. Is that a crime? My mother and I speak Spanish on the street. No, that's not a crime, but we know that it's a sign they're in gangs. Oh, Mr. Police Chief, and how many members of your police force speak Spanish? You have 60 police officers, right? Yes, we have 60. Well, none of them speak Spanish. So you know they're in gangs because you hear the Spanish, but you don't actually know what they're saying. I'm not sure that law makes sense. Is there a way that you could write a law that maybe considers that not all kids who look Hispanic and speak Spanish are gang members so that you can just arrest them because they're speaking Spanish on the street? No, we need the law right now. I said, well, why? Because people are being raped. Now, I'm going to stop my story for a second. This is a true story. This happened in 2006. Communication is so important. At the beginning of this story, the only story that was out there was how bad these gang members were and how good the people were, the good city council, at defending it, defending those young girls. Do you hear, is there a shift at all for you in the story? By shift, I mean, at first it sounded like this was a good idea, but when we were in the legislature and talking about it, What's the purpose of those hearings? Maybe their solution to the problem was a little bit too broad, right? And that maybe we needed to go back to the drawing board if what we really wanted to do was stop the violence against these young women, that making all Hispanic kids criminals wasn't maybe the best idea. That was kind of, that was exactly what we were trying, I was trying to do at this. Now, unfortunately for me, I was the only Hispanic guy in the state Senate on that committee. Um, and I lost the vote, but what, and I wanted, this is really the point of my story, but because the newspaper at the time, the Somerville Journal, was very interested in making sure that all those voters who were also my voters, because I represented East Somerville, knew that I wasn't supporting this law. As a leader, as a leader in particular who wanted to get reelected, I needed to make sure that I was quite clear about what I communicated in response. One, that I was opposed to the law, but two, that I was interested in stopping that gang violence in East Somerville. What did I do? I, first of all, went to East Somerville and met with about 100 people, 100 very angry people, people who were very angry at me, including the mom of that girl. And I had to be very clear about why it was. Not that I supported in any way the violence, but that this wasn't the answer. And that in fact the answer was being smarter about how we policed, coming up with a better way, 
You know, Lowell and Boston have gang units. And they actually study the gangs, and they track the gang members. They actually have people who speak Spanish on their police forces. So, Mr. Police Chief, maybe you could set up a gang unit and start collecting intelligence on the gang members and actually have people who speak the language, if, that's, if these are the people committing the crimes. The other thing I did was say that that's not the only way to stop gang violence, that we can invest in young people and give them alternatives to violence. So I created something. I passed a law called the Shannon Grant Program, which now funds about $20 million a year in anti-gang violence. But what it funds is the idea of investing in young people by giving them summer programs and things to do, not jobs, but alternatives to gang involvement. So at-risk kids, a lot of kids who've been in gangs or are connected to gangs, girls and boys, to give them that idea to prevent the violence. This was very important to me. This was, in my district, in my community, a leadership moment. It's much easier sometimes to go along with what everybody wants to do, particularly if your job is on the line, right? But it wasn't the right thing to do. It wasn't the right thing to do to say that every kid who happens to speak Spanish you know, is going to be subject to arrest if the police hearing them speaking Spanish, which was how the police department were saying they were going to enforce this, right? And that knowing it wasn't right, the next step was doing something about it. Each of you are, you guys are, I want to just step back for a second. You guys are going to be making a pitch for something. Your goal in this project is to make sure in the very short time you have, four minutes, not a lot of time, you've got to interest them in what you're doing. But you're also getting skills in this process that you will be able to use throughout your life. And part of the skill set that you're getting, leave the science aside, is how to communicate, how to engage an audience, how to communicate to them, and to persuade them. Sometimes, like me, you're going to find yourself in a position where you're standing up and everybody else is over there. Where you're by yourself because you believe that much in what it is you're doing. I'll say that it isn't just in politics that that happens. Talk to Steve Jobs. Well, you can't talk to Steve Jobs, but if you could talk to Steve Jobs, or you could talk to Mark, our friends over at Facebook, the folks, you know, was it Sergi or the guy that had, you know, one of the founders of Google? When they did these projects, they were standing over here, and everybody else was over there. And they had to persuade people, patiently but passionately, that their idea was worth investing in, that their idea was worth getting behind, and that the public, or this part of the public, should support them. So whether it's what you're going to do professionally or in your civic life, personally, to stand up for your community and the kind of community you want to live in, communication, and having the conviction, sort of the faith in your values, faith enough in your values to stand for them, they go hand in hand. Courage is another word for really what I'm talking about. These are the kind of things which I think, and this is, I guess, what I was asked to talk about, um, in my experience, and that's running the Red Cross, where we actually have, uh, we respond to fires, we run a large food pantry, we do uh, life-saving work every day. Or back in my years in politics, the kind of decisions that you have to make as a leader. And each of you are here because you're leaders. So I want to encourage you, and I'm sort of getting near the end of my time, I want to encourage you to think about, as you talk, think about some of the things that you want to say in your presentation, and think about why it is you listened to me today. I started with a story, and that got most of your attention. It's a great way to start a pitch. People love stories. We're kind of nosy by nature, right? We're sort of interested in how other people do things. Find a way to tell a story in your pitch. Storytelling persuades. And then find a way to make your point through your story. These are things that 
are effective ways of making, of getting people to nod yes instead of saying no. Remember, you might be the first person to go before your panel, or you might be the 20th person. Think about what the people on the other side of the table are going through, and how it is that you're going to get them from, you know those, that glazed look? You guys ever like sat down and like watched one of those Kim Kardashian marathons for 12 hours on E? Like by you get to the 10, you did, right? I did too. The 10th hour, the 10th hour, you're like, I don't care that she's getting married again, right? You're like, your eyes are glazed over. Now put yourself in the position of the person listening to you. What you have to say is interesting, but if they've turned off before you ever start, your challenge, the first challenge, isn't to persuade them to your idea, it's to get them to hear you, to see you, and how you communicate. Your presence, your clarity, your passion, your persuasiveness, all of those are things that will draw them in. So I just, um, I, we can stop and I can, I can talk a little more if you'd like, uh, maybe with questions. I think you said about five minutes for questions. But I just wanted to encourage all of you to think about telling a story that communicates your idea, and your values that are behind that idea, which are things that I try to do with my presentation to each of you today. And hopefully, these are things that might help you in your presentations in a couple of weeks. I'm sorry, so in public speaking, you, since you're first, I'm going to embarrass you. You, should, you. you are asking this question because you want an answer, but I suspect that other people in this room want to hear you too. One way they're going to hear you is with that microphone, the other is if you stand up. Because in standing up, you're inviting people to listen to what you have to say. Would you be willing to stand up and speak? Thank you very much. Because I want to hear what you have to say. My question is, when they ask us questions, do you have any advice on how to you know, respond? Because we're not going to have, like, we don't know what questions they're going to ask us. So. Sure. Absolutely. So I have a couple of ideas for you. When I was in law school, I did something called moot court. That's a fancy word for what you guys are about to go through, where you make your case, and then people bombard you with questions. Sometimes, and I don't know if they're going to be nice, I assume these people will be nice, but in the moot court, they wouldn't even let you finish your four minutes before they started jumping in with questions. So I know how worrying it can be, and it can be scary. So how do you respond? The first thing you do is you listen to the entire question. Don't get defensive. Don't cut them off. You need to persuade these people with your answer. So the first thing you need to do is let them know that you've heard their question. Then you acknowledge it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that question. Don't say, I don't think you want to say things. Some people will say, very good question. Like these people have like college degrees and graduate degrees, of course they know their question is good, right? <laughs> they don't want to hear from you that you think their question is good, but they do want to know that you heard their question. So acknowledging it, thank you for your question, something kind says that you heard it. And then you remain composed, and this is, will, they be, will you be standing or sitting? Standing. standing. So a couple of other things. Do this in the mirror with your friends or when you guys are practicing as a group. A lot of people, if you haven't done a lot of public speaking, you'll do this when you answer, right? That's not bad. That just says that you're not an experienced public speaker. And you can do it in the mirror and you can practice, right? And the other reason standing is good is that your voice naturally projects more and sounds more confident when you stand. And don't you want to sound confident when you answer that question? Now, the last part of my answer I can't help you with. It's like, what are you going to say, right? You've got to know your stuff. You've got to be, it's the other P. I said earlier, persuasiveness. I said passion. And I said patience. What's the other P? Preparation. You all need to know your stuff. I can't help you with that. I know that each of you are going to do your homework you will be able to answer that question. But if you're confident and you take a moment, you're not going to let your nerves hijack you. 
you will be able to answer that question because you will know the answer. Give a clear, concise answer. Your story comes in your presentation. Don't give seven stories when you answer the question. Short and to the point so that somebody else can answer the next question. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for that very good question. I shouldn't have said that. But that was a very good question. And you know something else that's very nice? When you're asking a question to somebody that doesn't know your name, is introduce yourself at least by your name. My name is? Okay. My name is Atel, and I was curious about your first time public speaking, speaking right. publicly. So um, that was a great question. What I typically do when I, have, when I do public speaking, by the way, if somebody doesn't have a microphone, Atel, if you, Atel? Atel, if you didn't have a microphone, my guess is, because we were right here, you would have spoken in a voice that I could have heard you, but the people in the back didn't. So typically what I would do is I would say, I would acknowledge the question. Thank you, Atel. For people in the back, what she asked was about my first time public speaking. That's a very gracious way to involve the whole audience. If I didn't, and I just answered your question, in the back, you guys would start zoning out because you didn't hear the question. How can you be interested in the answer if you didn't know what the question was? So it's a way of continuing to engage not just the questioner, but everybody. So you're curious. Now, you're now to answer your question, which was about my first time, when it was, and what was it like? What was it like? So there are people who are born in life shy, and there are people who are born ready for the stage. I was actually born pretty shy. And when I was a kid, I took piano lessons. And so my first time public speaking was at a piano recital when I was seven. And I was so nervous. All I could do was, I was supposed to say something, and all I could do was, you know, the little half bow and get the heck off the stage. Um, but over time, I found that, that, you know, most people, like, you're, it's worse if you're shy on stage than if you own the stage. Because if somebody's there and they're looking at you up here, they'd rather hear somebody say something that's intelligible right, and clear than something they can't understand. And, and well, I mean, so it's it like it was be a little, you're better off just chilling out and trying to get your message across. And then I learned the power of the story, which is that it's a lot easier, because you don't need a lot of notes and you're not reading from a script, if you're trying to make your points through telling a story. Because people like stories. People listen to stories. And you find a way to make your point through the stories the easiest way um, to communicate. And it, for me, that's always, I'm always confident when I'm sitting telling a story. right? It's just a lot easier. If I'm going through all these bullets in my head, instead of looking at you guys, I'm going through the bullets in my head. Um, it's not, not as persuasive, not as engaging. So thank you for that really good question, Mattel. OK, well, if you have a question you don't know how What's to What's your name? My name is Anjana. Uh, Anjali? Anjana. Anjana? Yeah. Nice to meet you. OK. Um, if you have a question you don't know how to answer, what would you do? That's a great question. Could you guys hear that question in the back? This is something all of us will face. So I actually, I'm going to tell you about something I did the other day. So I, I'm the president of the Red Cross here in Massachusetts. And we do disasters, like one of the big things we respond to. And so they, I was in Washington, DC about three weeks ago getting trained in how to do public speaking during a hurricane or, or right after a hurricane or a tornado or another disaster. That's really important because when the public is looking like after a, a disaster, right, they want to know where a shelter is or they want to know, you know what the damage is or whether they've lost somebody they love, they're looking to us to be calm and confident and for us to have all the answers. And I broke one of the cardinal rules during my training. That rule is never, ever make something up. I was asked a question that I didn't know the answer to. 
and I made it up. And I got caught. Somebody said, that's not the policy. Now, I'm, I said to myself, well, I'm brand new, and I'm just going to get through this, and maybe they won't notice. But you know what? If somebody notices, and you've answered it, and it's wrong, you lose all credibility. After all, what are you doing in your pitch? You're go Again? No, 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 no. It's Raisa. Raisa Rivera. Raisa, what do you do? And if they realize you've just told them something they know is not true, are they going to believe? They're not going to believe anything you said. Exactly. So, Anjali, you, if you don't know the answer, the most important thing is don't make anything up. You say to them, I don't know the answer to that. Or, I'm not sure I can answer that right here, right now. Can I get back to you? You always offer to get back to them. Can I, I want to confirm some information before I get back to you on that. Something that lets them know that you know it's important to them and that you will get an answer. And then what do you do after that you say that? You actually get back to them. You need to follow up with them. You don't say it to get the heck out of the room and then never speak. When you're done, you go over to them, you get their email address or some way of letting them know. I'd like to follow up. How can I get your email? And you do that. That is the most professional way of responding. And instead of saying to them, oh, this person's making it up, it says to them that you're an honest broker and that they can believe what you're saying. Because if you don't know it, you'd tell them. You may very well get asked that. They may ask you some trick questions. Don't make up the answers. Tell them on something that you don't know and that you'll, you'll, you're going to find out more information and you'll get back to them on that. That was a really good question. Yes? Well, I, I have a few questions. So and you what's know your how name? When, my name is Brianna. Hi, Brianna. You know how when you feel like you're trying to persuade someone to buy a product, but you're afraid that you're putting them to sleep? How would you then engage them again? Like you said, people in the back, if we were paying attention and things like that, since you know people in the front are paying attention, how would you engage someone who isn't quite interested? So that's, a, that's, a, so that's your first question? All right, I'll, I'll answer that one. Then if you have a couple more, I'm happy to answer them too. So this is, first of all, how did, do you all know the expression? You know what body language is, right? When, you are, when you're having a conversation with somebody, and a presentation is a conversation, because they're going to be able to ask, ask questions, right? There's actually a couple things going on. There are the words that we're exchanging. You're listening. You may have a question back. But there's also body language. She just leaned over and asked her a question, <laughs> right? I either said something that pissed her off, or I said something so intelligent that she had to tell her. But I'm reading there's something going on over here. When you all were in the back getting yourselves organized while I was presenting, I said that because I was trying to draw you in. Because you know what? I believe what I have to say is important to you. I think it can help you all in what you're trying to do. So point number one is believe in what you're saying and that it's important. And have presence as you deliver your message. Point number two is remember that people are human. We're all human. If that person behind the, on the other side of the table has been sitting there for a half an hour or an hour, they may very well be trying to be polite, but you know they're doing their laundry list in their head, like I gotta do this, and I gotta pick up my kids, and you know, I gotta go to the, pick up the laundry, or the, the, the dry cleaning. You don't know what's behind their mask, so you can say things like, at the beginning, you know, I know that you all have been here for a half an hour. Thank you for taking the time. I'm gonna be brief with my presentation. And I really hope that you like, but I know that you're going to like my idea. Something that shows confidence, but also understanding about what they are doing. Another thing you can do if they go glassy-eyed during the presentation, like they're halfway through and you see them kind of, remember body language, right? You're still looking at me. You guys haven't moved off. But if you were, right, like, I'd know that. I'd see, because they're looking over there in the corner. 
Like, you know, oh God, I gotta go watch the TV. What's on TV tonight? Is to bring them back in, you know, you can say, you can do things. You can engage them. The most effective thing to do is just look right at them, right? You're not looking away from me when I'm looking right at you, are you? You know? Body language. Not, 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 so it's not just what you say, it's what you do. And everything you do should communicate that you are so confident that your idea, that your science app is the very best, that they'd be a fool not to want to invest in it. Everything you say and do, that doesn't mean being arrogant. That doesn't mean like putting anybody down. It, but it means a fusing confidence in your idea. Okay, so, oh, Brianna. Yes, ma'am, Brianna, go right so, ahead. So, my second question is, you said that it's important to tell a story because people are nosy by nature and they like stories. So, you told a story about violence, but what about science? How is it, like, is it, it's not really that hard, well, not easy to find a story about science? Well, but you guys are coming up, Brianna, with an application, right, an app, right? Who's going to use the app? Why are they going to use the app? Telling a story about young person who, or not so young person, who, you know, and why is it that this matters? Finding a way to tell it rather than a dry scientific language, breaking that down and building it back up in the context of who's the consumer? Who's going to buy this? There's a million ways to break it out, that there's a way to draw them in. And I'm not saying use all four minutes on your story. I'm just saying, I mean, if I've got four minutes, I probably use one minute on my story, and then the other three minutes hitting home, what you know those investors are going to be asking, can they make money on it? You're, the kind of things that, and, and, and I'm not here to give you advice on that, right? I'm not a venture capitalist. Please don't listen to anything I have to say in that arena. My job, though, is to help you think about what you say to them, that you can engage them, and clearly communicate all the points that you know you have to make in a way that persuades them. So starting out by drawing them in is perhaps with the story is perhaps the most effective way of making sure they're listening to you for the whole four minutes. You know, four minutes isn't very long. It's not hard to hold somebody's attention for four minutes. Now, if you've got to give a speech for 40 minutes, then you're talk then you then it's a you're given a lot more in that. But you should be able to, I think, do that. Just know your stuff. Save time for questions and don't make up those questions. But in your four minutes, hit all your points, and draw, but draw them in first with that story. Any other questions, Brianna? The young lady next to you has a question. My name is Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin. And I was wondering if it's OK to ask questions to your audience to engage them. I, I believe in asking questions, but what I'm going to do, um, what I want to note is there, the most important thing to learn first is what are the rules of this particular engagement. There may be rules around, they're not going to ask you any questions, they're, not, they're going to listen to you first. You need to know what those rules are. And if those rules allow, asking a rhetorical question. Perhaps you wonder, why is it that this, or why, that might be a dynamite way to set it up. I don't think your whole presentation can be that. I think you lose. But to, to frame it around a question, perhaps tell a story, and then ask them, why would, why would a young lady you know, want to, you know what I mean, to sort of set it up like that, I think is fine. I think it's fine, but you need to know what the rules are and whether that's permitted. And that's a question for them, not me. Thank you very much. Great question. Yes, ma'am. OK, my name is Molly. Molly, yes. hi. Hi. OK. We've been making eye contact in the front row. Yeah. Um, OK, so <laughs> my question is, because when we're presenting, there's going to be like four or five or six of us on a stage at once. And while one of us is like speaking and, you know, like saying, well, OK, well, this is our app and this is what we're doing. And what should like the other like group members in the be doing because obviously like you can't all speak at the same time. So does each person get four minutes or does the whole group get four minutes? The whole group. Wow. I think, right? Yeah. So so everybody heard that question, right? And it's how many people in the group? Um, my group has five. Five. So I think some have like six or something. Five, six more. people. So uh, 
again, this is, my, this is me talking without knowing whether these are the rules, then what I would say, and this is just, okay, I'm, I'm going to be blunt, I think it would be really weird if I'm sitting here as one of the venture capitalists and I see six intelligent young women and only one of them is going to be talking. I want to know what all of you have to say. There's two parts to my answer. One is, you guys need to figure out who's going to say what, right? and finding a role for everybody. And then when you're not speaking and somebody else is, you're listening because your team is the smartest, most persuasive group. And if you're looking over here when she's talking, you're telling the person that what she has to say isn't worth listening to. So even though you've heard it 22 times already because you've been practicing, you look like you're so interested in what she has to say like you've never heard it before. Right? So you wait, and then you wait your turn until it's your turn to present, and they're all listening to you. I think you all might want to think about how to answer questions, because if you let it be a free-for-all, anybody from the six, maybe having an official person be kind of like your MC, who would like to answer, and, and ask among the other five, who, should answer, who would like to answer that question? Having a way to be a traffic cop, that might be an efficient way or if you feel like you guys can handle it without talking over each other, but you want to be as professional in your question answering as you are in your presentation. Right? Thank you, Molly. There's a question back here. Hi, my name is Mbunabasi, and I was wondering what's your best advice to get rid of nerves, like if you're nervous? Right. So the most important thing to know about being nervous is that everybody is nervous, right? And so a couple of things I would say to you is this, is that we've all, all of us who've done public speaking have felt it, and every time, at least for me, every time I get in front of people, I feel nervous. So what do you do about it? Well, one of the things you do is practice what you're going to say. I think there's a temptation sometimes, oh my gosh, I'm nervous. I'm going to write every word down and I'll just read. Have you ever seen somebody? What happens when you write every word down? What do you do? What was that? You'll read. And if you're reading, what are you not doing? You're not engaging your audience, right? And Brianna's off on planet Jupiter because I'm not engaging her, right? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to my paper. So one of the things you want to do is practice so you don't need to just read your notes. And you'll actually feel a lot more confident because you've practiced and you know what you've got to say. Right? I'd say the other thing, one of the nice things about this is it's a group. It's not just you in front of 500 people. Right? It's actually a fairly small group. So you'll have the ability to rely on your partners, your teammates, in this should you freeze up. But the other thing I would say around nervousness is don't forget to breathe. People forget that. You breathe from your diaphragm. You breathe deep. And you breathe regularly. Some people, when they're nervous, speak really fast. That's how I used to be. Some people get really nervous and they stutter. Some people get really nervous and they do this. So. Practice in front of a mirror at home what you're going to say. Don't practice reading it, because if you're reading it, you can't look at yourself in the mirror. That'll also make sure that you're making eye contact. Have it all up here. And breathe, and just know that it will be OK. And it will be. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all very much. Oh, wait, Brianna has a question. Last question. This is your third question. You know, I'm counting. <laughs> they, they keep coming up by you, actually. So when you feel like you've lost somebody's attention, what kind of attitude are you supposed to draw them back in with? Well, in this case, I would remember, it's how many people are on their panel? How many judges? Or three, judges. three. Just remember, don't give it all up for that one person. You've got two other people, right? So you're trying to engage all of them. So one of the things you might do is, as you're presenting, just look at that person, right? Look at all of them. You're making eye contact. But when Molly was asking her friend a question here, I just looked at her. And she looked right back at me. She knew that I was looking at her. And I don't know. It seemed to me that you were engaged again, right? 
right? Wow, they're looking at me. That, and you believe it or not, a lot of people don't do that. That person looks at their zoning off and I'll, and you respond by getting nervous or speeding up or talking louder. Don't do that. What you've got to say is important, right? You, you, this is your time and you're spending time preparing. And they're, they're, you know, they should listen to you and be confident and just make your eye contact and you'll draw them back in. And, um, and I suspect that that will work. This is a, in a fairly close setting like this, it's really hard for them to, if, if you're doing that, to zone out. It really is. Now in a group like this, where the folks, I can't necessarily even see, I'm getting old, I can't see the people in the back row, right? Like, I don't know what you're doing back there. Um, it's harder to engage, but in a small group where there's only three of them, you'll manage that. All right? Thank you, Brianna, and thank you all for having me today. I appreciate it.